Welcome to the Influence Experiment, where we seek to explore the art and the science of building influential capacity. Every month, we want to raise thought-provoking ideas of how you can be an investor of the influence you carry. If you're ready to journey with us, then it's time to experiment. Hey, hey, what is going on, my fellow learners and leaders? Welcome back to another episode of the Influence Experiment as we continue to learn how to invest our influence well. My name is Tony Villafan, and I am humbled to be your guide in your developmental journey as you join us around for this leadership conversation today. Today, we are talking about fundraising and donor development. This is a very niche and nuanced topic, but is no small conversation when it comes to nonprofit organizations. This is a crucial topic that involves much creativity, grit, determination, and ingenuity. At the same time, it also requires relational skills, relational equity, and the ability to inspire others. How does one fundraise and develop a donor base well? How do you handle disappointments and discouragement? What are the pitfalls to avoid? Why is it important to get FaceTime with your donors? what leadership lessons are gleaned in donor development. All this and more will be answered by Carl Edwards, who is the Director of Development at Cross Step Ministries in New Holland, PA. Carl, my man, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, my friend. I'm honored to be here. Looking Good. forward to it. Yeah. I'm so excited to have you here, my man. Thank you for being willing to say yes to this, again, very niche conversation. So as we, before we even dive in, could you share with us a moment uh, who you are, sure. what you're about, why you know a little bit about this particular sure. conversation? Yeah, yeah. Again, Carl Edwards, I serve at an amazing organization in the Alenco community called CrossNet Ministries. My role is Director of Development. Um, I've been at CrossNet for seven Seven years, and in this role for a little over three, which is which is really cool and exciting. Uh, it's been a lot of growth over the years. Uh, on a personal level, um, my my the best part of me is my family. Uh, my mm. bride's name is Mary. Mm -hmm. um, we've been married for about 13 years. Come on. We made it. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> uh, and we have two beautiful children, Macklin, who is 10, and Lincoln, who is eight. So. Uh, our kids keep us tired, I, which is great, I <laughs> which is great. Imagine. Yes, but Tony, thank you for that introduction, uh, spot on, and you inspired me even in the oh, introduction stop. about uh, what God is doing in our community mm. and uh, how I get to be a small part of it, so yeah. thank you. Well, no, dude, it's it's so cool to be able to uh, to know that uh, as uh, not just uh, as a, a brother in Christ, mm. but also as a friend and, and, and knowing that I, our our families go a little bit back here with just being able to work with Mary sure, a little sure, bit yeah. uh, in our time here at Gateway to uh, whether it's our connections through Lancaster Bible sure, College yep, so our, yep. our paths have crossed yep, in a couple passed, of different yeah. formats and so now to be able to cross in this specific format of talking about donor development yeah, and yeah. and sometimes can be a really yeah. awkward conversation yeah, yeah. and and uh, and tricky one to navigate and I just appreciate your willingness yeah, to step into this uh, now so hey as we start from kind of a 30,000 foot mm -hmm. look uh, what would you say is the difference between um, a nonprofit, mm -hmm. not for profit, sure. and for profit? Yeah, great question. Great question. So, if you think about for profit businesses first, right? For profits can raise money from private investors. They have stakeholders. That's their actual ownership. They're stakeholders, investors in mm -hmm. the business. And to be honest with you, they exist to make profit for those stakeholders. Yep. But then you think about a nonprofit, right? I serve at a nonprofit. The ownership of a nonprofit is the community. And they're, they exist really for the betterment of the community hmm. to provide resources and relationships for the community. So a nonprofit also accepts donations from businesses, churches, individuals, and corporations as well. But then you get to this last area, which is a little bit different, a little bit tricky, uh, and a little bit of a play on words sometimes too, which is that not-for-profits. And they exist specifically for the owner's organizational objectives, right? So that's different than a nonprofit. So non not-for-profits are not required to operate specifically for the benefit of the public or to advance a social cause like a nonprofit would. So yep. a little bit technical, but those are the differences between those three three sectors. Sure. Yeah. No, that and that's really helpful. Thank you for kind of splicing the yeah, difference between those sure. three. And I love actually how you said within the nonprofit that the ownership is the community. Yes, yes. That's uh I mean I haven't actually thought about yeah. that before that like uh, no like if I if I have a nonprofit oh it's 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 my mm -hmm. organization or my business but no it's the communities. Right. And I think that's a really neat way to uh, again, we're, as we're 30,000 footing this and we're laying a foundation, mm -hmm. a nonprofit, it can be through the lens of a community's ownership. Right. 
I think that's really, really neat. Yeah, to think and, and most nonprofits have a board, right? And the boards mm-hmm. are made up of community members. Yeah. So that's that that's that ownership part, that sector there. No, yeah. I, I think that's a really yeah. neat way to lay the foundation as we as we move forward. So like what does community, speaking of community ownership, yeah. what does community engagement yeah. and donor engagement look like specifically yeah. for you? Yeah. For me, you know, I, I get my my guideline or my filter or the grid of the processes from God's word, right? And in Galatians 6, it says this, right? So Galatians 6, 9 says, so let's not get tired of doing good. At the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. And the verse 10 says this, therefore, whenever you have the opportunity, we should do good. So that's Hmm. kind of the grid. That's the filter that that I engage my community with. And it's and simply how we engage our community, how we engage donor is simply being present, right? Mm, So I look at my role um, as a director of development is to give our businesses, our churches, and individuals the opportunity to be involved in God's work, right? We're a faith-based nonprofit, so I'm saying involved in God's work, but giving them an opportunity to give back, to look at a grander mission, to think beyond themselves. And it's simply building relationships with all of those entities. Um, That's why I said showing up, be present, and Mm. be present in community things, show up at things that don't have to do anything with the organization you're, you're working with. So it's showing up, being present, and building relationships. But I love what you said earlier in the introduction it's inspiring people to action. Mm. That's what it is. Sharing yeah. stories, sharing what's going on and inspiring them to not want to sit on their hands, yeah. but actually to, to get up and be involved. Yeah. Well, a word that you used uh, just a moment ago was you used the word present. And I think that that is a, a word within this conversation that uh, even though I don't fully know everything mm-hmm. you're going to say mm-hmm. in, the, in the questions that come, but like, I feel like presence is going to be something that could pop yes. up a yes. good bit uh, that, that we are, we are looking for us to be present with the community. Right. We're asking the community to be present with this vision or this excitement or this endeavor mm-hmm. or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. And then coming out of Galatians where you referenced Galatians 6 of doing good to everyone, mm-hmm. which is a, it, it's an inclusive statement mm-hmm. of we are doing this for everyone, community uh, uh, and anyone who we come in contact with. And so uh, I just think that's a really, uh, it's a really neat way to, to think about it. Um, and so let me ask you this question. Like what types of things do you ask from yeah. donors? Yeah. Uh, sp- like what do you ask from donors and how do you handle the discernment of what even to ask for? Yeah, that's a great question. So as I think about our organization and really anyone that is in fundraising or development, we're really asking for uh, a few specific items, a, sp- a few p- specific things. And I say three for CrossNet. Um, it's, we're looking at time and talents, mm-hmm. right? So we're looking for volunteers, people to invest of their time or their talents that they have. The second would be in-kind donation or goods. So as you think about our organization, we have a a food pantry or a food market. So we're looking for businesses, gleaning programs, farms, orchards to give of those goods that they have, right? Because those help on the financial side as well. Mm -hmm. If we are able to receive apples from a local orchard, we don't have to buy apples, if that makes sense. Uh And the the last would be finances, right? (laughs) I'm a fundraiser, so um, asking people for funding in their money is a a large part of of, uh, our what my job is. But to go to the second part of that question is how in the world do you even discern this? And that's a great question. Um, It goes back to the relationship. You're going to hear that all throughout our conversation today. Um, But I discern simply by listening. Hmm. Um, I meet with people on a consistent basis and I listen more than I talk. Hmm. I was meeting uh, some years ago with Hope International and their uh, development team when I was new to this role because I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, they gave me a piece of advice that has stuck with me over the last few years I've been in this role. And they said, Carl, you should be speaking less than 50% in every donor meeting that you have. So I should be listening a lot more than what I'm speaking. So I say that because in listening and in having conversation with them, you begin to hear and know what they're passionate about. Mm. And then I'm going to talk about those specific things. So I know if they have capacity to give funding. I know if they have capacity to give a good. I know if they have the capacity to give of their time. So it's all about listening. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) All about listening to them. I love that that, that principle to to think. Uh, a, la- a grid to think through of you should be talking only 50% mm-hmm. of to what you're listening and right. what you're hearing them speak. And I think that that's a, I mean, there, there's a, there's a great leadership yes, principle in sure. there, regardless of <laughs> yeah. donor development of how are we choosing to right. uh, listen twice as much as we talk yeah. in conversation and dialogue with people. But I just think that that's really good. Mm-hmm. And, and as you said, you're listening for what are their passion mm-hmm. points? Wow. What gets them excited? Mm-hmm. How can you, uh, 
uh, kind of what, what's the itch that you can sure, maybe scratch sure. when you are? Because there there is some yeah. tact in the yeah. way that with the yeah. reading between the lines yeah. of what you're listening yeah. for in those types of conversation. Uh, and so I just think that that's a that's a really good way to 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 think through and how do you discern what to even specifically ask for? Uh, what would you say is like why is it so important hmm. to acknowledge and appreciate your donors? Yeah. And, and what in the world does that even yeah, look like? Yeah. How do you do that? Again, Tony, I think it's a biblical principle, <laughs> right? In mm -hmm. Romans, uh, Romans tells us to take delight in honoring one another. And I think that's a lost art. I think it's something mm -hmm. that we don't practice very often. So I think in my role, but also, again, you said it just a, a few moments ago. I hope that what our listeners here and our friends that are listening uh, to this conversation here, these principles are not specifically for people that are in development and yeah. fundraisers. These are leadership principles. These are life principles on simply what it looks like to build relationship yep. and connect with people. Yep. So I'm hoping that you hear that in my responses as well. But to go back to your question, uh, simply put, we want to show appreciation um, for those who are generous, again, with those three resources that we ask people. Uh, the other part of this, uh, when I put on my development hat, is um, if you honor, if you acknowledge and you appreciate donors well, your retention rate for future giving goes up, mm. simply put, right? So Tony and Mary Beth, when they give to CrossNet at some point in the future, right? That's just a little, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm, a little, I'm just kidding with you. Subtle, yeah. Yeah, when, when you give to CrossNet in the future, you know, I have processes and goals of how we want to appreciate and honor you um, for your gift, but also I want to do it in a timely manner. So sure. there's data and st uh, statistics on how quickly I acknowledge you and thank you for your gift as well. So again, simply put, um, your percentage of retention is going to go up when you acknowledge and appreciate um, a donor. And then again, it's just important to do that in a timely manner. And our organization, uh, we pride ourselves in how we do that. And we try to do it well and quickly so that you know your gift was received, mm -hmm. it was appreciated, and then where the impact went from from your gift. Yeah, so, no, I, yeah. I love that. Thank you for being able to speak, yeah, of course. To speak, yeah. to speak into that. And so what are some of the pitfalls uh, to avoid mm. in fundraising and donor development? Yeah, this is, a, this is a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, to go back to our last question, don't miss opportunities to thank people. Oh, yeah. I hear it all the time in my field, Tony. Um, I hear it from donors that I meet with. Um, not necessarily that the, the donor is like waiting by their mailbox for you to thank them, but they do remember when they're not thanked. Mm -hmm. They remember when they don't receive a phone call, when yep. they don't receive a letter, when they don't hear a story or something. They do remember that. So don't miss opportunities to honor people. Don't miss yeah. opportunities to do that. The other part is uh, we try to avoid donor fatigue. And that simply means uh, not tapping on the same shoulders over and over and over yep. again whenever you have a need. So often across my desk um, comes needs from our programs and our organization. And it can be really easy because I know Tony and Mary Beth gave to this cause in the past. I could ask them again. But at the same time, they're going to get tapped out, right? Yeah. You know, funds um, are, are limited to a certain capacity. So avoiding donor fatigue. And then the other part is balancing, balancing the communication between desperation and need. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that is there are organizations sometimes that communicate we are desperate for needs. Our doors are going to close. Our programs won't function. I think there's a difference between desperation, desperation and really just communicating what's going on. Mm -hmm. Here's how you can support. Here's how you can get involved. Um, so we try to really hard to balance between those type of things. I think that if you communicate out of desperation, there are going to be some donors like, what's going on over there? How are you using your money? How are you using yeah, your funds? Yeah, Why are right, you always right. in need so, so badly? So um, I think those are pitfalls that you want to be, be careful of. You want to avoid and also just kind of be mindful of as you interact with with people and yeah. th those three that you just shared are I think those are rich mm. uh, to be able to say once again the idea of uh, not missing the opportunity to thank people I just I think that that we don't thank people mm. enough mm -hmm. just generally speaking we're, we, we're we're people to be negative we're people to be entitled we're people mm -hmm. to be selfish and uh and so to say hey like don't miss opportunities mm -hmm. to thank people is such a needed mm -hmm. concept not just in donor development yeah. but in life you're right it's, it's it's not about it's just not it's not my field right it's not yeah. just about when someone gives a resource or something like that it could be anything i i was thinking um about this this conversation and specifically this question um my son lincoln had a friend that got baptized a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. and their family sent a card to lincoln for showing up to his baptism oh come on yeah. lincoln yeah, didn't, yeah, yeah. Lincoln didn't <laughs> give him anything. He was just present. Yeah. He showed up. Yeah. And they honored Lincoln for just being present. Like that's, that stuff goes a long way. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And it just reminds me of uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 that says, give thanks in all circumstances mm. for this is the will of God in Christ yeah. Jesus. Like yeah. it literally says, do you know when to know? Do you want to know what God's will is for your life? Yeah. 
give thanks yep. in all circumstances. Give thanks to God. Give thanks to other people. Like be a thankful person. So this is this is super huge. And and again, this is not just donors. This is this is any leader. Period. How are you practicing? the discipline of thankfulness yeah. to your employees, yeah. to your colleagues, to your boss, to your family, to your coaches. How are you practicing thankfulness and yeah. uh, looking for the small things and the big things alike? Then secondly, you mentioned about the, the fatigue uh, of being able to uh, just acknowledge how often mm. the quantity of which I'm asking mm. uh, people, which is good. It's, yeah. it's, it's something we need to think about. And I know that uh, if I know that I have a volunteer or I have a, I have a leader who's very generous mm. with their time, then m- what's my knee-jerk correction when yeah. I have a need? I'm going to go to that person. Yep. But is there, uh, is there a discernment of when yeah. Uh, when did not put the ask out and yeah. maybe give it to someone else yeah. or the opportunity or so on. Can and I so speak forth- to that real quick? Please. Just uh, something that um, along those lines, something that we try to do at our organization um, is, uh, again, because we're talking about thanking people and appreciating and acknowledging, um, we try to thank a donor three times before we ask them for their next gift. Huh. And okay. that can be spread out. There's no scientific method yeah, b- yeah, behind yeah. three. It's just a number that we came up with. And that could be thanking via a card. That could be thanking via a phone call. That could be thanking via an email or a face-to-face. So if we're looking at you know, a major gift donor, if I ask Tony and Mary Beth for $5,000, they give $5,000. My goal is to thank them three times during the course of a month, a year, whatever the case may be, hmm. before I ask them for something, something else. But, I like that yeah. a lot, actually. And and if, if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, like I kind of like that too, and you're like, oh, but three sounds like two, I have too many asks or too mm-hmm. many needs all the time, then make it two times yeah, uh, sure. or one time. Yeah. But the, the principle stands yeah. of uh, thank your people, yeah. <laughs> no mm-hmm. matter how small, no yeah. matter how large, yeah. uh, thank your people. But I love that I love that principle that you you guys across the have formed of saying we're going to thank someone three times before mm-hmm. we ask them mm-hmm. uh, for the mm-hmm. next um, ask. That's really good, man. And then the third one you said, the balancing between desperation and need. And I think that's, again, that's a really, that's a nuanced, like, uh, discerning look to have of, of I, the phrase that comes to mind that it comes from another leadership principle is the, the tyranny of the urgent. Yeah, the yeah. idea that everything is always so yeah. urgent, and yeah. if everything's always so urgent, then uh, you're going to run yourself dry, mm-hmm. uh, and you run yourself dead as a leader if you're, you're demanded, but you're living out the demand of the urgent, uh, and it's tyranny, the same concept of everything is desperate, everything is desperate, well, people are going to be like, well, then we'll... What's going on? <laughs> like, <laughs> sure, what, what are you sure. doing? How are you doing? Like, well, uh, so on and so forth. But um, so I think that's that's that a, a piece to be able to to think through as well. That what's a, what's a desperate? What's a desperate? Ask what's a what's a need? Uh, what's a want? Mm-hmm. What's a preference? Kind of going all the mm-hmm. way down the mm-hmm. the line, if you will. That's really good, bro. Thanks for yeah, thanks for sharing those things. Um, and so, how do you make sure that you don't cross over yeah. to wait for it manipulation? Mm. And guilt tripping yeah. people because that is a let's be real in this topic that can be a yeah. thing and that we've all probably had examples yeah. of moments where that has not been done well yeah. where we have felt guilt tripped yeah. for an ask or we've been we have had this like twinge mm-hmm. of manipulation um, how do you avoid that yeah a great question you're spot on we've all felt it we've all experienced it from someone else so it's always on the for- forefront of my mind to not be that person. The other part, right, Tony, because this is also a little bit of personality. Mm. So if you remember Strength Finders, right, where they, they, uh, it's an assessment and they tell you what your top five strengths are. So one of my top five would be woo, right? <laughs> so this relational yep. piece to be able to <laughs> converse with people, there's a little bit of a chameleon to that where I can connect with multiple people no matter the background. But the shadow side of woo is manipulation. Yep. It's specific word. I'm, an, I'm, I'm a word. <laughs> yeah, so, actually so manipulation would yep. be one of the oh, shadow sides yep. of that. So it's something that I try to be careful for. And, and, and how I combat that, I think what your question is, how I combat that is caring more about the donor and the relationship than the ask. That's good. Don't get me wrong. I love CrossNet. <laughs> I love my role. I love what we do. Um, there are, we have goals, but I care deeply about the, re- uh, the relationship. I care deeply about the person, not just what they provide for our organization. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that is a child of God. That is someone that is using their time, their talents, their resources well. Um, I want to be very careful with that. And uh, another piece of this is, is if we push too hard, I don't think we leave room for the Holy Spirit, hmm. right? If, if I'm the one that is dictating the outcome of the ask, of the conversation, we don't allow the Holy Spirit to work in the other person's heart. Yeah. So I just want to be very care- careful with that. Yeah. And I'm also not trying to spiritually manipulate either, <laughs> but it's a, it's, a, it's a very organic conversation and I want to be very mindful that I'm not getting in the way. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. I also enter meetings not, uh, with an expectation that that person isn't going to say yes on the spot. Yeah. So if I'm presenting a proposal, I'm presenting an opportunity, I understand that 
that individual might need to take time to talk to their, their spouse or their partner, or they, they might uh, need to take time to pray about a decision. So just understanding that I don't need to have a decision in that moment, and yep. I'm okay with that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and I think that I appreciate your honesty with even using the um, the strength finders yeah. when you mentioned Woo, because yeah. as I said, that's me as well. Yeah. That was my third mm-hmm. in the in the top five of strength finders, and knowing that the use the word shadow side mm-hmm. of Woo is manipulation, mm-hmm. and the, the fact of the matter is, every single leadership trait mm-hmm. has a shadow side. Mm-hmm. Every single gifting has a weakness to it. And and so those of us who would say we have more of the, the wooer personality yep, yep. Uh, trait or leadership trait need to say, okay, like how are we not doing this for our gain? Mm-hmm. How are we not doing this out of uh, what can I get out of this or the manipulation piece? Because that's a real thing. Yeah. And and no one likes to be manipulated. That's a, that's a no duh. Mm-hmm. But some people... Uh, those of us, again, this, let's just, let me be really honest mm-hmm. and really vulnerable for a moment, but like, I know sometimes how to use my words mm-hmm. to get what I want. Mm-hmm. That's a scary thing. Mm-hmm. In a healthy place, it is the most, it's the coolest thing to be able to sit with someone and dialogue with them and, and, and meet them in a need and to coach them and to work with them, uh, to meet a felt need, mm-hmm. whatever it may be. And it can be very, very beautiful. It can also be really unhealthy. Mm-hmm. And in donor development, how are we trying to not manipulate people out of uh, and you also mentioned the idea of um, you're there for the relationship over the ask itself. That's huge as well. And I think that we need to be asking ourselves, how am I doing this? How am I living for the relationship, uh, not uh, primarily just for the ask? Right. And so those are some really key pieces that you, you've alluded to. And and this is why also self-awareness is huge mm-hmm. in this mm-hmm. conversation. As leaders, how are we knowing the strengths of which we have uh, while also knowing here are the shadow sides when I'm not healthy or when I'm not on my A game or when I'm not having people speak into my life over um, – the, the strengths that can turn into weaknesses very yeah. quickly. Yeah, so true. these are all really good things yeah, that we true. need to be yeah. talking about, not just as people who are looking to ask for, for people to donate stuff, but just as leaders, period. Yeah. So really, really, really good. Uh, with not Within nonprofits, um, can you speak to us about the scarcity mindset? Yeah. It's a term I've yeah. heard. I don't really yeah. know much yeah. about yeah, it. Give course. me a little bit about the scarcity mindset and how do you wrestle with yeah. that? Yeah, so simply put, scarcity, scarcity mindset means you believe resources are limited. That is just a thought process. You believe that there are, only, there are limited resources out there for you to obtain. So in a nonprofit, as you think about having budgets and goals, if you had a scarcity mindset, you were always worried or anxious about where funding, where resources, where time and talents was going to come from. Uh, the opposite of that is having an abundance mindset. I'm sure <laughs> you've heard that terminology yep. as well. An abundance mindset is resources are out there. The resources are unlimited. I, we just have to do the work to go find them. Yep. We know this is a biblical principle as well, right? We talk about our father in heaven having cattle on a thousand hills, right? Mm-hmm. So God is an abundant God. There are resources out there. We just have to do a little bit of the work to find that across. That's a mindset that we, we, we have, right? So um, again, I wrestle, don't get me wrong. I wrestle. I care deeply about our budget idea. <laughs> I care deeply about the goals we have. You know, there are times that I worry about where funding is going to come from, but I also am uh, extremely confident and my Lord, and I'm extremely confident that he has a hand, his hand on our ministry. Um, he just asked me to do some work. He yeah. asked me to build relationships. He asked me to go and find some funding. Well, yeah. I think that you just spoke toward uh, two sides of the same coin, mm-hmm. which is faith mm-hmm. and work. Right. <laughs> that is... Th- th- hand in hand. Take, yeah. take religion, take Christianity out of the yeah. equation. Is that the, there, there is still a need as we go throughout our jobs that we are putting faith in our teams mm-hmm. Uh, but we're also putting work yeah. into our teams. Yeah. We're putting faith into the organization, but we're also putting work into the organization. Yeah. We're putting faith in our God, but we're also putting work into what yeah. he's calling yeah. us in yeah. to. And so I think that that's just a, that's a huge piece to wrestle with uh, within the scarcity mindset. Because, yeah, that's, that's a real mm-hmm. thing. When, we re- when we're like, oh, my goodness, like, I, we don't have much going on here. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, we're not hitting budget. Mm-hmm. We don't have these, the items that we need for this. Like, and it can be, re- I'm, I can only imagine, especially someone who is ask, putting asks mm-hmm. out all the time, mm-hmm. how much you're tempted to maybe think yeah. in the scarcity yeah. mindset. Uh, but then how there is a faith, there's that faith component and just letting go, trusting God, trusting your teammates to do what they're supposed to be doing, right. uh, sure. hitting their goals sure. uh, that they're supposed to be hitting while also putting in the work on yeah. your end and, and trying to live competently yeah. in that. So uh, as we think about the uh, as we think about the influence experiment as a whole, uh, it's about finding the art mm. and science of building yeah. influential capacity. What would you say is some of the science, would yeah. you say the objective truth in yeah. fundraising and donor development? Yeah. And then what is some of the art, subjective yeah. personal expression in yeah. fundraising? Yeah, great donor? question. I think uh, about basic human needs, right? 
um, just basic humanity. Uh, I remember Craig Groeschel on maybe one of his former leadership podcasts said, all people want to be known and they want to be needed, mm. right? They want to be known and they want to be needed. So how in the world, in my role, in my capacity as a leader, do I do that with the people that I interact with on a daily basis, weekly basis um, at my organization? How in the world do I do that with donors? How do I acknowledge them and make sure they're known? How do I meet their needs as well? So there's this, this like I said, this basic humanity side of it as that, that science piece. Um, the other thing that I think about is, Tony, it doesn't cost much to acknowledge someone, right? It doesn't mm -hmm, cost true. anything to acknowledge someone or appreciate them, but at the same time, if you do that, you have the potential to change the tra tra trajectory of their day, yeah. the trajectory Oof. of their life. You know, I'm not trying to be extreme, but it's, it's, so, no, right. it's so true. It doesn't cost me a lot to say hello to someone. It doesn't cost me a lot to remember someone's birthday. It doesn't cost me a lot to, to send mail um, to, or whatever. Um, you guys, you know what this is like. Yes. You, when your grandma sends you a birthday card with five bucks in it, <laughs> it makes your day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes your day. And that doesn't cost that person a lot, but it does have the potential to change the trajectory of what's going on in that person's life. So I'm all about that and I wanna be a part, about, hmm. uh, part of that. As we think about this, this art uh, side, um, I think it's making each interaction personal, right? It's listening to the story, um, whether that is handwritten notes, I've said this before, but handwritten notes, phone calls, social media acknowledgement, face-to-face -face meeting, how can we make each interaction personal about that individual goes back to our listening. How do I, I, I wanna know what makes that organization tick. I try to remember those things, I try to write them down, I try to archive them so that every time I see them, I'm, I'm pulling up information from that Rolodex the, to, to make it about them. Mm -hmm. Not make it about me, not make it about CrossNet, but make it about them. Again, trying to make their day. That's the goal, make their day. Yeah, yeah that's the art. I yeah. love that. I think that's a great little, even little slogan there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Make, make their day yeah. uh, is, is, is a goal and an intent. And I think that's to be able to say it doesn't cost much to appreciate uh, and acknowledge mm -hmm. someone is so true. It mm -hmm. goes back to the whole concept of thanking people, mm -hmm. just to show acknowledgement. And, and I don't think you're, I don't think you're, uh, uh, making it too big of a statement when you say it can literally change the trajectory of someone's life mm. by just acknowledging yeah. them. I've, I've, I've been told how just simply a smile from someone can literally alter how they're feeling, mm. how they're looking that day. And, and so like, how do we choose to take uh, our acknowledgements of other people from, from a simple hello to a handwritten mm. card, to a donation, mm. to a, uh, a conflict moment, yeah. like the good or bad, yeah. how are we taking and yeah. acknowledging people, showing them value and honor yeah. as human beings. Yeah. I think those are very, crucial things as we think about th think about the art and the science and and, and so now when, when I think about uh, difficulty uh, there there's a difficulty that I know comes to mind when I think about donor mm -hmm. development and that is when people say no oh yeah <laughs> and and so you put an ask out and you're you get the pitch you're yeah. excited you build the relationship yeah. you then you, you offer it and they say no yeah. uh, how do you deal uh, with disappointment how do you deal with rejection yeah. and resist yeah. discouragement that's a that's a hard one um, you're right because the first instinct is to take it personally <laughs> right and to put that pressure that I messed up that I did something wrong if I only would have asked for this amount opposed to that amount um, you know I had a typo in my proposal whatever the case may be uh, human nature especially for me is to, to take it personal mm -hmm. and just to carry that and it uh, becomes a burden and to be honest with you, Tony, I thought I was going to have a whole lot to say about this question, but God's done so much work in me, and there's been so much growth in this area. Um, there was a, a gentleman uh, some years ago, one of the global leadership uh, summits, mm. his name was Zha Zhang, and he did a whole rejection experiment. He did this, like, I don't remember all the details, but I think he asked, like, a hundred different things of people, and he was surprised at how many people actually said yes to him okay. with some things. And I've learned so much about that that... I just need to put more ask out there, right? Oh. I need to put more ask out there because the more ask I put out there, the more yeses I will receive. Uh, the other thing is specifically to your question, I view every single no as a not yet. 
hmm. as a not yet. Um, <laughs> okay. I take it, there's a little bit of that competitiveness in me, there's a little bit of that competition, and I just got, I have this mindset of that donor doesn't know, but in the future they will be partnering with CrossNet. Mm. They will be coming alongside. So I view it uh, as, as, as a not yet, and not as this personal no, um, they don't like what we're doing, or they don't like me as an individual, just as a not yet. Okay, so let, yeah. me, let me lean into that, yeah, that for, not for sure. yet yeah. piece, because uh, that, that, that's an intriguing thought, because I, I, can, I can think that as well, mm -hmm. like youth ministry. Yeah. Oh, like if I throw a pitch to someone to serve and, and volunteer in youth ministry and they say no, I'm like, oh, like I'm going to, I'm going to get them eventually. Yeah. I'm like, there's a couple of people that I've been working on for like two years yeah, yeah. even trying to still see if they, but how do we make sure that doesn't turn to like a, a, a pride? Yeah, because you're obviously right. you're it right. can be, because I'm you're like, right. oh, like who am I to think that like I'm, this is where they ought to be serving. This is where they ought to be yeah. donating to yeah. CrossNet. Yeah. So like, how, how do you, how do you, how do you dance with that a little bit? You're right. It's the fine line that we've talked about before is that fine line of woo manipulation is that fine line of confidence and arrogance is that mm -hmm. fine line of, um, hey, they gave an answer, but in my mind I'm saying not yet, so how closely do I walk it? And it's, it's time. It's time, right? And it's also just getting to know that person deeper and better. And uh, we talked about listening so much already, but just going back to that a little bit, if I can spend time, if I can get to know their heart, if I can hear what's going on, if, if maybe it's a season, right? Maybe it's a season in their life where they have to say, have to say no. You talked about working on a volunteer, a, a person potentially for two years. Same thing in our organization, right? Um, I, there's businesses, there's individuals I work on for a long, long, long time. Mm -hmm. And what it comes down to, it wasn't the right season. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the right time. And I have to be okay with that. I have to be patient with that. Yep. And I'm willing to wait. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Thanks for yeah, uh, sure. splicing that just yeah. a little bit for us. But speaking of not being maybe the right season, or, or how how do you discern when it's not a good when it's a good time to toss in the towel of a, of a yeah. campaign yeah. Or, or a developmental project uh, versus when you just need to like double down? Like, yeah, yeah it's not the right season. Yeah. It's not the right season. But I'm gonna keep trucking. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep hitting my you know, head through the cement yeah. brick wall until it comes yeah. down. When the when do you need to when do we know? and it's time to collapse a project, to fold yeah. it, when it's, no, we just gotta keep trucking through it. Like You're what? asking such great questions. These are, this is what I process on a daily <laughs> basis, Tony. I don't know if you knew that or not, but you uh -huh. know, there's, this is the stuff that I think through. Um, and I don't always know the answers hmm. to when it's time to throw in the towel or when to keep pushing. I don't always know that. But what I seek to do is, is have the humility to know when something didn't go as planned. Yeah. You know, have the humility to say, it's okay. The other thing that I try to do, uh, whether it's a campaign or, um, I use the, the language test run or trial very often. Okay. And if I communicate that ahead of time to where people on my team or people in our community know that something's a trial or a test run or we're experimenting, <laughs> they're way more forgiving sure. if it doesn't go well, right? <laughs> so it's not like, oh my word, Carl failed or CrossNet failed. They're way more forgiving. The other thing is if it goes well, they're like, why in the world is this a test run? Let's keep this yeah, going. Yeah, yeah. Or whatever, the, whether it's a campaign or a project or a funding opportunity. So again, it's just having the humility to know that, but also just using the intention language. Um, the other thing I try to do, and we do as a team, it's not I, it's really us as a team, is we reflect on the outcomes of every event, every fundraiser, every campaign, everything that we do, and we use any um, potential failures as fuels for future planning. So we debrief everything, we debrief it hard, and it's not just like the bias of our team, we get feedback. So when we yeah. do events in our community, we survey people that attended, we survey our vendors, we yep. survey everyone so that we're getting accurate feedback so we know how to grow. Um, so it's, again, it's just, it's, it's processing everything as it comes um, and having the grace and the humility to say, hey, it's time to be done mm -hmm. or let's keep going, mm -hmm. let's be patient, we'll figure it out. As a leader, right, we are called to be innovative and creative. Mm, That's yep. the work that we have to put in. So sometimes if it's that doubling down and continuing, it's me saying, maybe I'm not thinking about something right. Maybe I'm missing the mark. Maybe this is the wrong individual, the wrong business. Maybe it's over here. Um, I, you're going to hear me say Craig Show a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I listen same. to his podcast often. But he always uh, talks about um, it may not be option A or B. He talks about option C. Yeah. There's often an option C. And we're, we look at life often through A and B and miss the option C um, or the outside of the box, mm. you know, processes so yeah yeah well I think that uh, you, you you spoke towards two two specific things that were very helpful to reiterate which was to say have the humility mm -hmm. when things don't go as planned mm -hmm. and that humility piece is huge mm -hmm. uh, well, and obviously th that's kind of a no duh to yeah. say but to know that when you are pursuing these projects and it's your it, it's your baby mm -hmm. or it's the mm -hmm. thing that you have 
spent hours mm -hmm. of time into mm -hmm. to be able to say, uh, oh, we need to toss in the towel, or oh, we need to drastically change mm -hmm. our our approach or something like that. It takes a lot of humility yeah. to be able to to be able to, to do that and to say, yeah, these things didn't go as planned. But then you also said, hey, we're going to we're going to uh, decompress and talk mm -hmm. about this and reflect back on it. And, and, oh, uh, framework that I love to think through is SWOT. Yeah. Uh, when you when you kind of SWOT something, you think through the strengths, you yep. think through the, the weaknesses, you think through what are the opportunities yep. for the future, and what are the the, the threats of yeah. the of the future yeah. within this particular yeah. event yeah. or team or whatever it may be that you are SWOTing. Yeah. And and so to uh, to be able to uh, think through those two frameworks is gonna, is going to be really really helpful when in discerning is it time to move on hmm. and stop. Or is it time to double down and just put your head down and keep on going? Uh, and, and, and so those are two really, really yeah. good things. So thank you for, yeah, for sure speaking thing, man, into yeah. that. So what would you say is the impact of donors and supporters coming to your physical building to see what is happening in real time? Or maybe if you don't have a physical building, just getting FaceTime yeah. with you or the people yeah. or whatever it may be. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really important. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do, first of all. Um, 20, well, let me let me just give a little bit of context. I have a really unique role. Um, I am not in the trenches like some of my, my colleagues and my coworkers, right? They're leading programs. They're meeting with our participants um, who need resources. They're in the nitty gritty. They're connecting with people that experience trauma that mm -hmm. are often in crisis mode. So they're living in kind of a triage mode themselves. So I have this unique role. I share their stories. Mm -hmm. I share the wins, the losses. Um, I share the hard things. I hear, I share the, the life changing moments. I hear how God redeems. I hear how people break cycles of poverty. So I have this really unique perspective in this unique role, and I want to get this information into the hands of people as quickly as possible and as often as possible. Mm -hmm. And one of the best things for, that I can do is get people on campus where the programs are actually taking place, yeah. uh, where they can see our food programs in action, where they can see our youth programs in action. Um, where you know they can hear me you know presenting at a church or presenting at a business presentation um, they can hear all the data hear all the stats and things like that but when you come on campus and you can actually see faces right where those those uh those stories you've heard now have faces yep and these mm -hmm. people now have names it makes a significant impact um i can't i can't like share it enough the importance of just getting people where you are so they can see it. Um, getting mm -hmm. one of the things I love to do is, you know, if I have a business that I'm working with um, and they're always, they're looking for opportunities to get their people on campus, come serve. Yeah. Come serve in our mm -hmm. food pantry, serve in our free summer lunch program, yeah, yeah. serve at one of our outreach events, come to our community meal, serve, get hand, get your hands dirty. Um, you know, and uh, I start to see change. I start to see impact and I start to see influence because of, because of some of those things. And it's good. It's really good, yeah. I can only imagine how cool it must be when you have someone who donates financially and then they come yes. and use their hands yes. and their mind yes. and, and yes. to actually get yeah. some physical work yeah. done and how yeah. that, uh, I can only imagine how yes. cool that must My be. My friend, we have, a, we have some donors that don't live in our area. They live out of the state and each summer they come and they serve in our free summer lunch program. And every, it has been multiple summers, every summer they're like, I see where my money goes. Hmm. I get it. Oh. It makes sense. And again, they know yeah. they're obviously giving, so yeah, yeah, they're yeah. passionate to some capacity. But when you're, you're right, Tony, when the, that light bulb moment goes off, it's that aha. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And they love being a part of it. And it's I pretty cool. That. Yeah. I love that. I love and, those moments. <laughs> and, and, and I, and obviously that can't, that, that, not all donors are going to yeah, be able to do that, sure, course, uh, but yeah. how beautiful it is for the, for yeah. those who are uh, able to, to do that. And uh, can I just ask you, like, what for you? What's one of your uh, maybe think about the the annual rhythm of CrossNet's like calendar? What is there a particular event that you guys do uh, to appreciate donors, sure. or like how do you? What's one of your bigger ones sure. maybe that you try to do? It's actually this month, right? So April is you know Volunteer Appreciation Month, right? Or yep. Donor Appreciation Month. So all month long. Every single one of our program managers and directors, they're honoring their volunteers and donors in a unique and specific way that looks different based on the program. Um, but again, for CrossNet, looking at my specific role, um, we do that throughout the year consistently. Um, sometimes that's in smaller groups. Sometimes that's individual. Um, one of the, I'll, I'll speak to, to this. So uh, we have individuals that give to CrossNet monthly, mm -hmm. right? So that is a recurring check that comes, yep. a, recurring, a recurring swipe of the credit card online or something. So we are purf purposeful in thanking those donors twice a year. 
Okay. Once, one time a year, they're getting a handwritten card from myself and board members. Yep. The other time, they're getting handwritten cards from participants, mm. people that are in our program receiving support and services, and a lot of them are kiddos and students, which is pretty, yeah. pretty cool. So it is a part of our rhythms on a consistent basis to to thank them well. Yeah. yeah. No, I like yeah. that. I like that a lot. Uh, so we've been we've been starting this out at like thirty thousand foot, talking yeah. to us about yeah. nonprofit, not yeah. for profit. Um, uh, what? Let's get as like specific as we can sure, try to get right here. Sure. Uh, do you have any practical yeah. tips, any tricks yeah, on yeah. how to build yeah. a donor base? Yeah, yeah. Um, I hope this can be helpful again in any platform. Um, but one of the, the biggest tips and tricks that I say is use your donors as advocates. <laughs> mm, your donors like know people that you do not know. Yep. Use them to introduce you to their friends, to their families, to their other colleagues, to other business owners. Tony, it's one of my favorite things to see happen at CrossNet when a donor connects me on an email or invites me to a meeting with someone else that is not connected to CrossNet. Yeah. They are selling our organization because yeah. they're involved. I'm not doing any work. I'm filling in gaps, so that's it. Yeah. So that is one of my biggest tips and tricks is use your advocates. Use people that know you well to sell your organization, to sell your product, to, to um, just introduce more people. That would probably be number one. The other thing is understanding this, right? So we've talked about listening, we talked about some of those things already, but what I've learned in development over my time there, what I've learned from other people, you'll hear me talk about that in a mm -hmm. little bit, but um, donors fall into two buckets. There are donors that, um, you know, they wanna hear stories. They wanna hear life change, they wanna hear transformation. Um, so there's this like heartstrings yep. pull, right? Mm -hmm. And the second pull, uh, bucket is analytics, stats, mm -hmm. data. They want to hear numbers. They think it's great that you're housing people, but how many? Yeah. Right. They want to hear that you're um, you're serving people in the food pantry, but how many families? How many individuals? You know, they want to hear um, that you're using your resources well, but tell me about your annual budget. What's your yeah. profit and loss? They yeah, want to know yeah. that. So I think um, you need to understand those two buckets and where people fall and be able to communicate to them effectively. I shared with you earlier, if I know that a donor, you know, loves youth programs, they're all about kids, I am not gonna waste my time talking about food nutrition. Sure. I'm not gonna talk about social services or community. I'm gonna talk about the impact that youth are ha uh, that is happening with the youth in our community. Same thing with this. If we know that a donor is all about stats and data, don't waste your time talking about, you know, that kid that, fill in the blank or yeah. that person that fill in the blank, mm -hmm. share the stories, share, sorry, share the stats, share what's going on, share the nitty gritty. And the last thing, again, I know this is a broad, but I think it is a tip and a trick. Be present in your community, show up the stuff, right? <laughs> so in our community, right, we have a ministerium, right? We have a business association. Um, I speak at churches, get out into the community so that you're known, right? So people's like, oh, that's Tony from Gateway. I saw him there. So just getting out in the community so people know who you are, what you stand for is always important. Yeah. I think that you just laid out three really practical yeah, tips yeah. actually. Honestly, the being present in the community, uh, using your donors as advocates. I love that word yeah, by the way. Thanks yeah. for thanks for throwing out yeah. that word uh, being an advocate, uh, the donors uh, viewing them as advocates and then uh, thinking through the discernment of what type of donor am I talking yeah. to? I think yeah. that is something yeah. that uh, it, that's huge actually. Mm. I don't think we probably think about that enough when we are trying to uh, or even taking this, take this in another angle of leadership where do I, when I'm, when I'm having a conversation with someone, am I talking to them, uh, knowing that they are an external processor mm. or are they an internal processor? Sure. Yep. Uh, if, if I, if someone is, if I'm talking with someone and I'm expecting them to externally process with me in real time, but they really just internally process, you're going to be putting your, you're going to be putting your head up against the wall because mm. you're trying to demand stuff out of them that they're not mm -hmm. ready to, to share with you. So True. it's knowing your audience, yeah. knowing your yeah. person. And I think that uh, trying to splice between is this a donor that loves the stats mm -hmm. and, and kind of nerds out over that mm -hmm. stuff in the, in the coolest of ways while the person is like, no, just tell me the heartfelt stories yeah. of the people. Yeah. Like both are, both are valid, both are true, mm -hmm. both are needed. Uh, and so those, that, those are really three good practical yeah, sure. tips and tricks for us uh, to, to hear and to receive. So thank you for that. Uh, when we think about leadership just as a, as a whole now within this conversation, uh, what have you learned? Hmm. What leadership lessons have you learned from being yeah. a director of development? Um, I learned probably more of my flaws, <laughs> more than anything, uh. in my in my shortcomings, and that's okay. Um, you talked about um, 
I think you said, what did you say, uh, like self-reflection and evaluation uh, earlier. And I, or you said oh, self-awareness, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I, I'm learning to be aware mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, of my blind spots in my leadership. And one of the things I would communicate, my biggest lesson is the importance of team. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Having a team, surrounding yourself with people that think differently than what you do um, is so important uh, having people that uh, can champion the cause, that can um, push back at you, uh, that will process with you, um, that will ask questions yep. of you is so important. I think some of my growth as a leader, some of the growth of our organization uh, is because of the team. We have individuals that are in the right seats on the bus yep. and we know the direction that the bus is going. The other thing that I would add is stay laser focused on mission. Yeah. Stay laser focused yep. on your mission. And that could, again, that's a leadership piece, whether that's uh, you're a business owner, whether you work at a nonprofit like I do, whether you are um, you know, a stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home dad or whatever the case may be, you have a mission and you have a vision for what God has called you to and a purpose. Stay laser focused on that because yep. there's a lot of good things that are going to come at you um, and some of those good things you need to say no to. So at CrossNet, we have our mission in mind and everything that we do. And if it does not fit our aligning values, um, we say no to it mm. because we know what the mission is. Yep. Yeah. I love that. It's, it's such a difficult principle to live out. The idea of if, if you can't draw it back to your mission, mm. you maybe you shouldn't be doing mm. it, but to have that as the grid that you think through is, is, is crucial. Yeah. And, and so when you say like leadership lessons that you've learned from this is you said learning from, you know, learning from the mistakes, learning for, uh, to, to rely on your team, uh, learning to stay laser focused. Those are all excellent yeah ideas and principles that we can we can glean from um, in this moment uh you know carl's we we've covered a lot of ground we're kind of beginning to lay in the plane of this conversation on donor development uh what resources yeah. uh, would you recommend yeah. if someone wanted to take this conversation and learn just a little bit further yeah um i would surround yourself with mentors um that are in the field um i uh, I'm, I'm new to this area just of a few years, so I have surrounded myself with people that have been in development and advancement and fundraising for a long time, mm -hmm. and they are a phone call or a text message or a meeting away, um, and they meet with me on a consistent basis and support and encourage. Uh, the other thing is uh, be a lifelong learner, so conferences, podcasts, like this one you're listening to right now. Um, Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, so I've been, I've been, I've attended quite a few conferences to learn. The other thing is a book that was... Uh, pretty impactful. Um, really, um, in this area and many others was Rooting for Rivals by Peter Greer. Peter Greer okay. is the president of Hope International, uh, local Lancaster County nonprofit. And um, the book is amazing. And the book communicates what the title says, right? Um, it also talks about the scarcity versus abundance, right? And it talks about um, how can we champion causes and other yeah. people's causes as well. So Rooting for Rivals by Peter Greer. The other ship is uh, align yourself and partner with organizations in your field. Everance Financial, Ambassadors Advisors, the Timothy Group, these are people that have been doing this type of thing for a really long time um, and can be your advocates and allies and mission, mm -hmm. yeah. Huh. Talk about an, uh, an appealing title of that book, uh, Rooting for Come Rivals. On, that right? sounds yeah. really enticing, yeah. honestly. Yeah. That What in the world does that mean? Yeah. So you, you've uh, you've struck my curiosity yeah. with that particular yeah. book. But then even knowing the different uh, organizations that are out there, like uh, Everence and Ambassador Advisor and Timothy Group, uh, are, again, knowing knowing who's in your field. Yeah. Yeah. Super huge to know that. Who's doing it better than yeah. you? Because yeah. let's be real, there's always someone who's doing yeah. it better than us. Mm -hmm. And we're, if we're not humble enough to realize yeah. that and look out yeah. for the, uh, the ways we can learn from other people. There's no reason to compare. Just learn. Yeah. Just yeah. learn from people. Yeah. Oh, that's rich. There's yeah. no reason to compare. Just, mm -hmm. just learn. Yeah. Okay, as we, as we finish up here and as we land the plane, uh, any final words of wisdom, advice, maybe caution sure. that you would give to our listeners as we end? Yeah. Um, maybe one or two thoughts. Uh, the first one is, friends, as you think about being a leader, as you think about being on mission uh, in your purpose, whatever that looks like in your context or your platform, I want to encourage you. Uh, you've heard me say this. I'm going to say it in a different way now. Um, see needs and meet needs. Hmm. That's, that's where it starts. That's where it ends. Um, is your willingness to um, have that emotional intelligence to know what's going on around you. 
um, whether that's in yourself and what's going on in your sphere of influence as well. Um, the, the other part, friends, is again, I, I hope that the information you heard today, um, again, we're talking about something very specific in my, my ministry context, my career context, but I think there are so many principles that can be applied to yep. your day-to-day -day life, yep. to your leadership, and as you just interact pe with your neighbors, with people in your community. The last thing, friends, I would love to show you around CrossNet. Mm. If you are in uh, Lancaster County uh, and you drive through the New Holland area, um, stop by CrossNet, ask for me, and I would love to give you a tour and show you what's happening. Um, I believe God is at work in the in our community, and uh, it's pretty special to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think I can not think I know that I can speak towards what I you said. God is working, and I know God is working, mm -hmm. and I know He's working because there are organizations like mm -hmm. CrossNet that are pouring in, doing things uh, perfectly. Of course not, mm -hmm. making yeah. mistakes. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> but like, man, you guys are meeting the felt needs of the community, and you're you're present, and you're engaging, and you're you're. Uh, thinking about the, the relationship over the asks and, and all these different pieces that we've, that we've talked about today. Um, Carl, my man, like you're, 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 you're spearheading some of this stuff. And, and I just love that you have such a passion and how clearly it's showing in, in our time together here. And, and so I just want to say a huge just thank you. Like, mm -hmm. thank you for, for seeing a need and meeting a need, mm -hmm. for showing up, uh, for having faith and having the work, mm -hmm. uh, the two sides of the coin um, that I just see in you, my man. And, uh, and just thank you for your faithful work and your service to uh, the kingdom of God, to, the, to CrossNet, to your family, mm -hmm. uh, to, your, to your sweet wife and kids mm -hmm. who I love mm -hmm. and see. Uh, and Scene and and uh, just just thank you no. and thanks for being present today yeah, and, humbled, and speaking to this humbled by the invitation it was great to be with you and um, be an encouragement hopefully to yeah. those that are listening absolutely man absolutely man thank you so much if you are enjoying what you're listening to you're liking what you're hearing would you be willing to give us a rating uh, hit the share button wherever you consume the content and we hope that you will join us next time as you can as we continue to explore the art and science of building influential capacity catch you next time.